Father, thank you for Mike. We thank you for saving him, for sanctifying him, Lord, for using him in ministry in many different settings to many different people. Thank you for your faithfulness to him and through him to your people. And we pray now, Lord, that you would you would open our hearts and our minds to your word, that we may hear what you have for us. Lord, I want to pray specifically for those um, they they need a specific thing from your word this morning. Maybe they're they're holding on to a a bitterness or a hard heart. Maybe they're just afraid to come to you and trust you. They don't know if if you really are trustworthy and faithful and good and kind. Lord, I pray that you'd work in those hearts, work in those minds, soften them and draw them to you now through this message. Lord, we trust in your word and we thank you for the gift that it is in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, truly, it is God's word that has made the difference in our lives. Um, this is free, above and beyond what I had prepared for today, but Brandon and I came from um, middle-of-the-road church backgrounds, um, and when you uh, live in the middle of the road, both sides shoot at you, right? And we knew that uh, when we were going to get married, we, we had a conversation, and we uh, both had good jobs, and we had the option to just have everything the world offered, or we could go all in for God, and uh, we decided to go all in for God. It wasn't really a hard choice for us, and we started getting more and more involved in um, in the church where we were going, and um, uh, just started paying more attention to God's Word, and uh, when we got involved with Word of Life, and really started doing the quiet time and uh, leading the small groups. Uh-oh, i got to run a lap around the church. My phone just went off. Uh, when we started getting involved with Word of Life and uh, doing the quiet time, leading the small groups, seeking the application from God's Word to our lives on a daily basis is when our growth curve went from this to this. And God really started working in our hearts. It was God's word that uh, made the difference. And uh, as you made me think of that when you were uh, talking and praying for me, Pastor, uh, I just thought maybe I'd share that little bit of testimony there that, uh, that we attribute it to God and his word. Uh, there is there is always there's been a long joke between Fran and I and different people that we talk to. We can't do anything. We, we don't sing. Um, you know, we're not high scholars. We're not, uh, you know, there's nothing that we really bring to the table except that we'll let God work through us and we'll try to obey him. And uh, and God seems to want to use that. And really, when we get some extra time and we sit down and just kind of think and reminisce a little bit, uh, it's just crazy um, when we look back and see all the things that God has done around us and through us and with us, uh, that we can't help but praise him. And uh, and it gets us through some tough times. And uh, we're, we're just so thankful that he's said that he would use us and that we, uh, that we can be in this ministry. And, um, and there's just not much more that we can say, but praise God, amen. And, uh, and let's just stick to his word. Uh, so, uh, you can see our grandkids up there again. We, if you weren't here for Sunday school, uh, we gave the report in Sunday school. Uh, there's uh, seven grandkids there. One's on the inset, and uh, the other seven were actually there when the picture was taken. And then there's one more that's coming in April. If you want to hear more about them or about our children, maybe some of you know our children. Uh, there could be a few people here who remember our kids from when they were kids. Uh, that uh, If you want to talk about them, uh, you can see Fran at the table or uh, catch me somewhere and we can tell you what's going on uh, with them right now. Uh, but they're all married. They all have families. Uh, a lot of good things going on in our family. And we're very thankful uh, the way that God has um, has used our family and has protected our family. Uh, so as we get into the message here, I want to cover some verses that are really um, familiar. And then I'll go into, uh, we're going to be in uh, John chapter four today. John chapter 4, if you want to go to a passage and wait for me, that would be the one to go to. I'll throw some other verses in there along the way, but 
Uh, John chapter 4 is the main body of the, of the uh, message today. We're going to do missions uh, from uh, maybe a different angle than you've seen before or recently. Uh, but uh, let me pray and we'll, we'll jump into it. Heavenly Father, we are thankful again for your word. We're thankful that we can compare your word to your word and we can learn more about you that way. Lord, we are thankful that you have revealed yourself to us in this way so that we can look at it again and again and again and continue to know uh, what you have said to us. Lord, we praise you. We pray that you would speak to us once again today from your word and that uh, we would have a heart that would be open to, to follow it. Lord, we praise you and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. And so it's a very familiar verse, uh, Acts 1.8, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. And so the power there is the power of God, it's the power of the Holy Spirit uh, coming upon us. Uh, it's, we, like I was just saying, we have to remember, we have to continually remember it is God that is at work here. He just chose to use us. He just chose to work through us. And uh, Jesus is saying here that uh, these people that are, he's just about going to um, ascend uh, up into heaven here in a couple of minutes. And he's saying, you're going to be my witnesses and the Holy Spirit's going to give you the power to do that. And that is uh, the power of the Holy Ghost coming upon you. That's the dunamis power. That's the overcoming power, uh, the power that can propel you. Uh, the power is. Uh, God in you or with you, okay? So it's not something that you have to generate yourself, but it is something that you have to allow to happen in your life. You can you can push it down. You can you can uh, quench it. Uh, you can say, I I believe I need to talk to this person, but I'm scared, and so I'm I'm hoping for another way out. I'm hoping that somebody else will do it, or uh, you know, like. Uh, I, I just, I just can't open my mouth, you know, something like that. And that's happened to me before. And uh, let me tell you, my experience with that is when, when I can't open my mouth and witness when I know, I mean, I've got that in my heart that I know God wants me to talk to this person, and my jaw just doesn't move, uh, and I feel bad because I'm, I'm afraid to talk to them. When it's all over and I haven't talked to them, it's worse. Right, I feel worse then because I've missed my chance. I can't go back and get it. Uh, and maybe the person would have made me feel bad, or maybe they wouldn't have. I don't know, but I don't know because I didn't try and I wasn't faithful. Right, and I just want to be faithful. And so that helps me more now that I I've more experience and I've had those uh, experiences uh, that I'm willing to let that power go through me to somebody else. I'm willing to uh, receive the Holy Spirit's uh, push to go ahead and be a witness. And I'd rather do that, even though it's scary, than to not do it and have that guilt afterwards. And so uh, God, there's still grace for that. God still loves me. He still wants to use me. He gives me another opportunity. Uh, but you shall be my witnesses. Uh, that's what Jesus says. We have a part to play in this. Uh, every one of you who trust Christ as your Savior, you trust Christ as your Savior because not only of what Jesus did, and I'm not saying, I'm not adding something to salvation here. I'm not adding anything to what Jesus did on the cross. That's all we need. But somebody told you something. Somebody printed a track. Somebody, uh, somebody did something so you heard about Jesus Christ. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, so it's not salvation plus, but it's just that. It comes out through people. God chooses to use people. Even if you're one of those people that just walked by and picked up this paper from the ground and it was a track and you looked through it and you said, well, yeah, I guess I need to pay attention to God and you get saved. Uh, still, somebody printed that track. Somebody paid for it. Somebody laid it out. Somebody uh, arranged it, all that stuff. So um, we have a part to play. It's clear that we have a part to play. Uh, there's no other way to look at it. Uh, we have to respond to God. We have to be a part. We need to uh, be a witness, as Jesus says. You will be my witness, and 
the Holy Spirit's going to come and help you do that. And so uh, he says to do this wherever you are, in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. In other words, where you are, where your neighbors are, or where anybody is. Uh, it's not saying I need to go to Jerusalem and start witnessing to people and then work my way out into Judea and Samaria and then maybe make my way back here uh, to the uttermost part of the earth. It's saying uh, where you are, where your neighbors are, where anybody is. Uh, we were taught in Bible school, Acts 1-8, as an uh, outline for the book of Acts. And um, really, when you look through the book of Acts, that's kind of the way it's going. It's, it's in Judea, it's in Jerusalem, and then it spreads out to Judea and Samaria, and then, of course, with uh, the Apostle Paul going out to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so uh, let's just kind of keep that in view, keep that in the back of our mind. Remember that it says Samaria. That's going to be important later on in my talk. And uh, I want to talk about cultures today, too. And so I've got a map up there on the screen, and you can see uh, a map of South Africa. And um, Many of you uh, probably haven't been to South Africa. Steve has. Uh, but uh, in South Africa, it's really clear that there's different cultures. So uh, the second circle from the top up there is kind of where we lived. That was Pauteng Province. That's where Johannesburg is. Uh, that was a really fast-paced culture, kind of a hard culture, kind of a rude culture up there. Um, as far as South Africans go, it was rude. It wasn't wouldn't be rude compared to an American city, but... To their city, it was a, it was kind of a hard, rude place. Uh, if you went to the north, it was more of a, a farming kind of apples and grapes and oranges and stuff up there. Uh, get down there on the coast, it's more tropical. That was a slower pace, more of an afternoon off kind of a place where you'd get up early and you'd work and you'd take the afternoon off and then uh, kind of get back into it before the evening was over. Very hot there. Kind of a desert in the middle. Uh, again, another slower pace. Uh, very studious down there on uh, the Cape Town side, uh, very studious place, um, very uh, more laid back than Johannesburg, but still a city, um, a lot of maritime stuff there. So there was different cultures in South Africa. And, uh, you know, I might not have all those circles exactly in the right places, but the point is, no matter where you went, you had to approach people and you had to approach things differently. Uh, you had to look around and see what was going on and uh and say things in a different way uh in michigan i've divided it up a little bit differently as well uh there's definitely a division between the east side of the state and the west side of the state and uh, pastor i think you were over there before and i i hope you would agree with me that the east side is very different than the west side and i think uh pretty much universally people uh agree about that now i put lansing in the east side uh culture a little bit they don't want them um they want us to take them we don't want them either but uh i would say probably uh you know in general lansing is more like flint or saginaw or something like that than it is like the west side of the state uh then if you go up michigan to the north somewhere uh maybe around mount pleasant reed city somewhere in there where the trees start to turn from maple trees into pine trees and birch trees and beech trees somewhere in there there's kind of a difference where, uh, you know, it gets a little slower, not, not just slower pace is all I'm saying. It gets a little slower. Um, yeah, I didn't really mean to. I think they're smart. I just think they don't move very fast. All right. Uh, a, a little more laid back. Maybe that'd be a better way to say it. And then, of course, when you get to the UP, it's another thing again. Uh, and uh, I've shared this screen in a few different places, and so far everybody's pretty much agreed. Again, uh, you can move those lines around a little bit. This is not inspired. This is just me uh, thinking through things and working on my experiences, so you can differ with this if you want. Uh, but, you know, it, the point is, the point here is that uh, there's different cultures even where we are, and we were talking in Sunday school about the Spanish-speaking culture that's in uh, our side of the state particularly where the blueberries grow and where the strawberries grow and where the grapes are and all those things. There's a huge population of Spanish speaking people. Some of them uh, with all their papers intact and everything. Uh, some of them uh, just came across the border and here they are uh, living quiet lives, working, trying to earn money, sending it back to their family uh, down in uh, South America, Central America or Mexico. And uh, uh you know, I mean, our issue is not so much 
what their paperwork looks like, but what does their heart look like? And what can we do to help them come to know Jesus Christ? And so from the point of view that, uh, that I take, uh, you know, that's another culture that's inside our culture. I could probably put a bunch of uh, uh, circles in there for all those little people groups. And then I have a church uh, that works with us uh, that has a club in Kentwood, Michigan. And apparently Kentwood High School is uh, got all kinds of people groups and it's like the melting pot of west michigan of or something like that uh we, i know somebody that's a teacher in there and uh does some counseling and stuff in there and uh there's just all kinds of countries represented right there in kentwood michigan not that far from here right uh and probably if i knew more about you know i live closer to kalamazoo but it seems like i know more about grand rapids uh but if i knew more about kalamazoo i'm sure we'd see uh, that kind of thing here as well. And so um, we have to realize that, you know, in missions, in our mission uh, as Christ's representatives here on earth, that we, we just have to recognize that everybody doesn't think the same way that we do. Everybody doesn't process information uh, or get information in the same way that we do. And sometimes while the gospel doesn't change, we never change uh, you know, the gospel, Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. He was seen by hundreds of people. That never changes. But the way that we approach them, that might change. The way that we convey the information, that might change. And so uh, I just want to demonstrate that it is that way right here where we are in Michigan. Now, I know I've showed you this chart before. I've been using this chart for a few years now. Uh, but this chart just seems to be a very informative chart and helps people uh, kind of get the idea when I'm when I'm trying to talk about this kind of stuff. Uh, we'll say that we're one culture. We're uh, West Michigan people. We're the yellow culture. OK, and we want to reach somebody that's from a different culture. Maybe we want to reach the Spanish speaking community, which is something that God's laid on our heart for our ministry here in uh, in West Michigan is to try and reach into that. Spanish-speaking community and see uh, see God bring some people to Himself. Well, they'd be the blue culture. Well, how do I interact with them? How do I talk with them? There might be a, a language barrier. Uh, maybe they can speak enough English to uh, work on my farm, but they can't speak enough English to understand what I'm talking about when it comes to sharing the gospel or um, you know just just sharing. Uh, truth from God's word in a general way. Uh, maybe they're just not catching it all. And I need to overcome those barriers, right? And so uh, to do that, we would build some sort of a relationship or we would find some kind of common ground. Uh, I mentioned in Sunday school that, you know, uh, I was with a, a Spanish speaking pastor last week up in Grant, Michigan. And he he told me, he said, you know, uh, you can go knock on doors around here, but if the Spanish speaking people, people from Mexico or South America are in there in that house and they look out and they see me standing there they're not going to answer the door they might think that you know I'm from immigration or something like that uh, I might be there to give them some trouble or something and they they won't uh answer the door but this pastor who is from Mexico uh could go there and talk to them freely okay because he he lives in their culture right and now if I went with that pastor and then we began to talk with some of these people, right? And then if I went and knocked on their door, they would recognize me as Pastor Morales' friend, somebody that, he, that you've talked to before. They would have a little bit of background on me. They would know my heart a little bit because we've spent a little bit of time together. That would be a green zone there. That would be the green zone that I'm talking about, a compatible third culture that is emerging from their blue culture intersecting with my yellow culture in that little relationship fostered by Pastor Morales, bringing us to a green zone where even if Pastor Morales is not there, now I can talk with them and I can share things with them. Now, I still might have a language barrier or something like that to overcome, but there's a little bit of a feeling of trust there. And that's what this slide is about. And that's what. Uh, we're going to look at here in John chapter 4. Let's see how Jesus related to people like that, okay? And I think that uh, that this conversation that we're about to have is going to startle a few of you 
Uh, but if you think about it, you're going to see where I'm, what I'm talking about. You're going to see what Jesus is doing here. Uh, so the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4 is the story that we're talking about. And so just a little bit of a background here. They had some background noise in their culture. Uh, the Jews and the Samaritans get, didn't get along with each other. So the Jews were, you know, Jews from all the way from Moses' day. They had the law. Uh, then now the, the Pharisees and the scribes were increasing the law. And uh, they had a certain way that they had to live. And certain people they accepted and certain people they didn't. And the, uh, the Samaritans were uh, Jews that got taken over by Assyria in the first captivity. And the Assyrians came in and they, they crammed a bunch of their culture into their culture into the Jewish culture, and they come up with this hybrid culture, and the Jews that were still quote-unquote holier than thou didn't like those Jewish Assyrian people that they called Samaritan. And it was common practice for them to avoid one another. If a Jew was in Jerusalem or in Judea, and they wanted to go up north to the Sea of Galilee or somewhere up in there, instead of taking a direct route right through Samaria, they would go all the way over uh, to the river, and then they would go north, and then they would come back over into whatever area they were trying to get to. Uh, so the, the Jordan River was kind of their pathway up. They would go around Samaria to avoid the Samaritans because they didn't like them. Uh, they, they didn't think they were clean. They didn't think they were right. They didn't see them as people. They saw them as somebody else, as a different people group. <clears throat> Jesus recognized similarities and not the difference. And we'll see Jesus overlook some of those cultural differences here in a minute. Jesus' history on earth was kind and supportive to the Jews' rivals, the Samaritans. And um, I'm just going to look at this story here. I want to pick it up uh, in verse, verse 6. And I'm going to read a little bit, and then we'll go forward with the slideshow. Now, Jacob's well was there, and he's in Samaria. <clears throat> and Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, so the middle of the day. And there came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat or to buy food, and then Said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask to drink, uh, ask me for a drink, which I am a woman of Samaria? One, two. I'm a woman, and I'm from Samaria. For the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that said to thee, Give me to drink, Thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. And then they go on, and she starts talking to him about where this living water comes from. And we'll pick the story up here in a couple of minutes. But Jesus, he said, let's go through Samaria. We must needs go through Samaria. And, and he liked Samaritans. His references in general were good to Samaritans as he taught other places in the Bible. Uh, and so Luke 10, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, it was the Samaritan that came and helped the man that was harmed, that was hurt, that was by the road. It wasn't the priest, and it wasn't the Levite that stopped and helped. It was the Samaritan. It was, it was the person that the Jews wouldn't like. And when you think about this, who was Jesus talking to when he gives this? He's talking to the people that are giving him trouble, the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious elite of, elite of Israel. He's telling them, this guy was hurt. It wasn't the priest that helped him. It wasn't the Levite that helped him. It was the Samaritan. It was that person that you don't like. It was that person that you try to avoid. It was that person that you don't love. And when we think about missions and we think about uh, finding people and, and, and uh, trying to win people to Christ and stuff like that, you know, it's, it's harder to go and find somebody who maybe doesn't look like you or doesn't speak your language and try to strike up a conversation to make a relationship with them. Uh, it, it's much more difficult than to just find somebody that's kind of from the same background you are 
and start talking about Christ. Okay? Uh, and maybe some of those people are people that you don't like. Now, uh, I've been working on this for quite a while, and uh, I'm a human, and I have emotions, and I have problems just like everybody else, right? And uh, most of you that are in here can remember 9-11. And I was just kind of right in, I was right in that time during when 9-11 happened. Uh, you know, my kids were young. I was working. Uh, I love America. We hadn't been on the mission field yet. And uh, 9 11 happened. And I remember uh, all of us going from the floor into the break room uh, so that we could see what was going on on TV because uh, of the airplanes that hit the World Trade Center. And uh, you know, I remember the guys, the other guys that I work with, talking about, wow, I wonder how much it's going to cost to replace that airplane. I wonder how much damage that is to that building, you know? And I was like, you got to be kidding me. You're talking about the building and the airplane. What about those people? You know that plane was full of people. You know that building had people in it. And, uh, you know, I was like, who would do this? Who would do this? And then, of course, you know, it came back to um, Middle Eastern, Arab-speaking people, uh, extremists, okay? Not just any of them, but just these ones. And, you know, my emotions and my mind just went to, wow, I'm just really uncomfortable with those people right now. And at that time, I really didn't like them much, and I probably wouldn't have. Uh, I just, I mean, look, I'm just being honest with you. And I tried to overcome that, and I still try to overcome that today. That would have been my Samaria. Jesus would have been saying, these people, in, in my parable, it would have been, those Arab people are the ones that stopped to help. And you won't even go talk to them. Do you understand what Jesus is saying to the religious elite of Israel here? They need me. They need a savior. And you're not even willing to recognize them as people. But Jesus does. The ten lepers that Jesus healed. Jesus points out the thankful one was a Samaritan. Again, he's talking to the religious elite. Your guys didn't come and thank me. It was that, that person that you don't like. That's who came to thank me. And they're, they've got to be going, ah, you know. And, and they get mad at Jesus and they persecute him more. And then reference Acts 1.8 that I had up on the board earlier. Judea and Samaria. Jesus says, go to Jerusalem. Go to Judea and Samaria. Don't go around. Go to Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus is telling his Jewish disciples to go where they would not normally go. And this is just, I guess, minutes or not a short time before he ascends into heaven, right? The hated Samaritans are included in the calling. The hated, whoever it is for you, don't call it out, right? I'm not asking you to give yourself up. I'm just saying introspectively, the hated, whatever, are part of the calling. They're people. People who need a savior. People who are beset by sin. With only one solution, the same solution that you have. If you've trusted Christ. They need the same solution that has been given to you. And Jesus is there with the Samaritan woman. He treats her well. Uh, He's personal. He asks for water. He says, give me the drink. Engages in a conversation that rises above the objectives. The, uh, not the objectives, the objections. Who are you to talk to me? I'm a woman. Jewish men don't talk to women in public. 
Who are you to talk to me? I'm a Samaritan. You're a Jew. Jews don't talk to Samaritans. I mean, by the demographics, you hate me. Of course, it's Jesus. He didn't hate her. But the demographics would show you that, wouldn't they? He rises above those objectives. And he says, if you knew, if you knew, you would be asking me for living water. And she starts to catch on a little bit. You're asking me for a drink. Where does this living water come from? In verse 11, the woman said to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence hast thou that living water? Art thou, art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Well, it's not a point of pride. For Jesus, I mean, he is greater, but he's he's not going to lord that, right? And bam! Culture match right there. Our father Jacob. Jesus could say, our father Jacob. A green zone. A common denominator. Something that they both have in common. A road that they can go down together. A culture match was born. It was always there, but now it's recognized. It's out in the open. The Samaritan woman is the one that actually brought it up. Jesus knew about it. Jesus knew where he was going. He knew that that was Jacob's, uh, Jacob's well. And he knew a lot about this woman, right? The culture match is born, and he begins to talk to her some more. Culture matching played the role. Jesus loved her through all the differences and faults. And then there's the husband's conversation and the place of worship conversation in verse 20. For thou, um, verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. That's what the Jewish people would say, but this is Jesus, right? So they worship, and they got their high places, they got their idols, they got their, their things. They're not in Jerusalem. The Jews would say, no, you have to worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, believe me, the hour comes when you will neither worship in this mountain nor in Jerusalem, or worship the Father. You worship, uh, wor ye worship, ye know not what we worship. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And he goes on to talk about himself. So now they're having a common culture experience. And she begins to believe. She says, eventually she says, I know that the Messiah is coming. He says, I am the Messiah. And then... She believes, and she goes to tell her friends, right? So she goes from this little green zone where she's talking to Jesus, and they've come to an agreement about Jacob's well, and they've come to a place where, you know, I think maybe you're a prophet. You're a little different than some of these guys are. And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm the Messiah. And she's like, I believe it. You've told me all about my husbands. You, you've told me you've come in the right spirit and mind frame to talk to me. And you know, she's thinking all these things, and she believes him, and she goes back then. So if she's the blue culture, she comes into this green zone, she meets Jesus, she believes, and she goes back into her deep blue culture, and she starts telling people there. That's where we're trying to get. We're trying to find people to get them in the green zone that we can train. That's what we did with Spoo and Diana. We came to a place where we worked together. We had a relationship. It took some time, but we built that relationship where Spoo began to trust me. He believed that I wouldn't lead him astray. So if I said something that didn't sound right, he had enough confidence to ask me about it so we could get it ironed out. Never meant him any harm, but there were times when uh, the way I would speak as an American, would say, he would have a mixed message, right? 
But he knew me well enough to say, what does that mean? And it was simple stuff and it was complicated stuff. You just never knew when it was going to happen. But we had that green zone. And then he could take all that stuff that we pumped into him that, that he learned, all the Bible studies we did together, all the just practical things, the knowledge that you need to know uh, to deal with people in life. He, he learned all that stuff and he went back into a Zulu culture and he was able to speak in Zulu and give it in a Zulu way and replace my American illustrations with South African illustrations that worked. And he was able to win people to the Lord and start youth groups and do those things, things with people that I would never have a conversation with because they wouldn't trust me that way. That's what Jesus is doing here. Many more believed, and the belief was in Christ. Down here in verses uh, 40, 39 to 42, let's read that. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed him say, um, for the saying of the woman. They believed him because of what she said, and which testified, he told me everything that I did. So when the Samaritans were come to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them and abode there two more days. Now, just think of that, right? Here's these Jewish people who normally wouldn't go through Samaria. Now they're going to stay there two days with them. Huh? That's common culture now, right? That's a green zone. And many more believed because of his own words. They came closer to Christ. They believed what the lady said because of she learned it and she came back into their culture and she made it explainable to them so they could understand and they could learn. And then they came to meet him. Kind of like if I'm with Pastor Morales and I'm knocking on one of those doors because I'm with him, all right? She brought them back and they met Jesus and then they believed because of him. Transferred it right through. And said to the woman, now we believe, not because you say anything, uh, uh, because of thy saying, but we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Our belief in Christ, develop a green zone with another culture and treating them like Christ treated the Samaritans and seeing them take Christ into their common culture is a really cool thing when it happens. With Arthur and Lucy, uh, Fran and I were in South Africa. There's, um, I don't know what, three quarters of a million Chinese people in Hautang province or something like that. There's a lot of them. I don't know what the number is exactly anymore. But I got this phone call, okay? And so Chinese people would have been something I didn't have any experience with, okay? Not that I was like, you know, afraid of them at the time, but I just didn't have any experience with Chinese people. And so Arthur calls it uh, Chinglish, what he speaks, right? I didn't, that's not me slurring anybody. That's what Arthur calls it, okay? And uh, I, I hear this guy speaking to me in, in Chinglish. Uh, we want, I'm not going to try and imitate him for you. That wouldn't be right. But he's, he basically, he says, um, we want to start a youth group. We've heard about Word of Life. Um, we like your doctrine. We'd like you to come and train us. And we're like, sure, we'll do that. You know, I mean, primarily we went there and we expected to be working among Zulus and Sutus, you know. And then here's Chinese people. We're like, okay, you know. And we started uh, doing that. And, uh, you know, the first few meetings, we we're just kind of going over facts and things that we do and things that you need to know and built a relationship with them. And then they started asking us about, personal matters, different things about how the Bible relates to marriages and, um, you know, kids and relationships and different things like that. And we ended up discipling them for like three years or four years because that green zone kept growing. But along the way, they would go back into their Chinese communities and speak Chinese, Mandarin Chinese, and tell them the things that they were learning from our Bible studies together with them. And Chinese people were coming to the Lord because Chinese people came into this green zone, learned some stuff that they didn't have a good uh, outlet for in their own culture. Although there are Chinese believers and there are churches there, but just they didn't have any, right? 
and they started talking to their other Chinese friends and winning them to Christ. And that picture is a group of people from their brand new youth group in the church that uh, they're an example of people who memorize verses and listen to Bible uh, uh, accounts and lessons and stuff like that. But nobody had ever asked them, do you want to trust Jesus Christ to be your savior? They did. And they got baptized. That's a picture at their bap after, after their baptism, right? Fran and I, we, we visited that youth group plenty of times, even taught a lesson or two, but that was Arthur and Lucy learning from us, taking it somewhere else, sharing it, and those people trusting Christ and, and honoring him in believer's baptism. Lucy's family back in China, they go home to China almost every year at the end of the year. Uh, her family, one by one, coming to the Lord because she would go and talk about Christ and she would talk about the things that we learned. The same was true with uh, Spoo and Diana. Um, same kind of thing there. One time I was out, I think I told you this story before, but I'll tell it very quickly now. Uh, we went out to teach and I was going to teach a module and he was going to teach a module and back and forth like that for the day to start a new youth group. I taught the first module. All the youth leaders smiled at me. They nodded their head yes. made me feel like I was the greatest teacher in the world, right? Spoo came up next. They said something to him in Zulu, and he started speaking Zulu back to them. And uh, they were interacting with him. And so I just let him teach the rest of the day. And then uh, in the car afterwards, I asked him what happened there. He said, well, they, they wanted me to speak in Zulu, and then they started asking me questions about the module that you taught. I said, why didn't they just ask me? He said, well, in our culture, it would be rude for them to ask an older white man questions. Okay, so they were black, not that far away from apartheid, right? Just maybe 10, 15 years post-apartheid. And their culture was, we can't ask you questions. And I was like, oh. And I didn't do very much teaching anymore after that, outside of teaching Spoo and Lawrence and Kudane and Kobile and those guys, right? And I would teach them and send them out. So uh, here we have the verses that, some of the verses that were quoted just because it's a missions mindset. Uh, There's no difference between Jew and Greek. The same Lord over all is rich unto all us that call upon him. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, how the how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? And when they're sent, they just got to build these uh, avenues of conversation and uh, and they can be effective in transferring God's word if they get out of their own way. If we all get out of our own way, and we look for those common opportunities with other people. We can share the gospel with them, even though we're not very much like them culturally. If you're here today and you haven't ever said, I want Jesus to save me. If nobody's ever said to you, have you ever asked Jesus to save you? Have you ever made the decision for yourself? You need to make that decision for yourself. Your parents can't make that decision for you. Your relatives, other relatives, they can't make that decision for you. It has to be you saying, whoa, I know I'm a sinner. I need a savior. That savior's name is Jesus. He's the one that died for me. Jesus, I want you to save me when I die. If you want to do that today, I want to talk to you before you leave. Pastor wants to talk to you before you leave. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. And right here, we don't have to get into a green zone. We're all in the same common culture right now. If we need to get into a zone, we can. Just let us know. Heavenly Father, thank you. We pray that your name would be glorified and that your word would be uplifted. And Lord, we pray that if there's anybody here that needs to know you personally, that they would talk to us today. Lord, we praise you and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.